I need a new dust filter for my Hoover Max Extract Pressure Pro Model 60. Can you help me with that? I'm not your lawyer anymore. I'm nobody's lawyer. If the fun's over, from here on out, I'm Mr. Low Profile. Just another douchebag with a job and three pairs of Dockers. If I'm lucky, a month from now, best case scenario, I'm managing a Cinnabon in Omaha. Better Call Saul is my favourite TV show, and something that kept me hooked from episode 1 was wondering where this man, Gene Takovic, would end up. So today, I shall be analysing the season openings as well as the four episodes containing Gene, and highlight the brilliance of Better Call Saul. The very first scene of Better Call Saul opens with a black and white montage of Cinnabons being made, and straight away I need to talk about the importance of these sequences being in black and white. Of course there was a point in time where all media was in black and white, and when it's present in modern media, it's a deliberate decision on the creator's part. This choice can be applied to the content for several different reasons, such as intensifying the atmosphere, capturing the period it was set in, or to emphasise the tone of the story. There are also several different reasons for why it works in Better Call Saul, the most obvious being that it distinguishes the timelines. Throughout the show we see Jim and Begill trying to build his practice as a lawyer, and facing a lot of trouble. We have all the events with Saul Goodman in Breaking Bad to keep in mind, as well as the parts in this show where the timelines cross over, and lastly we have everything post Breaking Bad with Gene Takovic. These sequences being in black and white also supports the tone and how empty everything feels for Gene, after he was forced to leave behind the lifestyle he loved to become a nobody. The emptiness here is even more apparent when accompanied with the 1930s song Address Unknown by the Ink Spots. It further adds to the distance, making us feel like this took place such a long time ago. But after several shots of the employees and customers inside Cinnabon, the camera pans up and shows us Gene Takovic for the first time. And despite being far from Albuquerque, we already get an understanding that he is very paranoid of his past coming back to haunt him, as one of the customers looks in his direction with quite a serious expression on his face. He then gets up and starts walking towards Gene, but it turns out that he was just heading outside as he spotted people that he knows but this is clearly something that Gene fixates on and worries about frequently. In the next scene, Gene is at home making himself a drink and getting comfortable in front of the TV. He then gets back up and digs for a secret box and pulls out a VHS tape. He puts it in, sits back down, and straight away we all know that he is watching the glorious Better Call Saul commercials. When legal forces have you cornered, better call Saul. And a little subtle detail is that we see a reflection of colour in his glasses. This is the first of only a few times in these black and white scenes where we see a glimpse of colour. This is used to reflect his past as Saul Goodman, or even further back to Jimmy McGill. After a whole season of witnessing Jimmy McGill slowly building his practice as a good, honest lawyer, although with plenty of dodgy methods along the way, Season 2 once again opens with shots of Cinnabons, followed by Gene and his colleagues closing down for the night, accompanied with the song Funny How Time Slips Away by Billy Walker. To some viewers these scenes may feel fairly mundane but I can't stress the importance of scenes like this and the way they just let the story breathe. This should be especially important in a TV series. If we contrast this with a show like Obi-Wan Kenobi, it's clear which one has the better structure. Both shows contain a main character who is forced into hiding after a rather catastrophic event has taken place. They are now working normal jobs and simply going about their lives, trying not to get caught. However, Kenobi is a measly six episodes, 
and rather than taking its time showing what his life will be like on Tatooine for years to come, the series only spends a portion of the first episode on this, before he goes on a mission and is getting back into lightsaber fights. It feels as if he barely left that behind. We never got a true sense of how he coped with being forced into hiding, because we simply didn't see enough of it. Better Call Saul is often described as a slow burn series, but if you ask me, the slower pace absolutely works in its favour. This character was on top of the world at one point in his life. From his perspective, he has lost everything. And just by including one flash forward at the start of the first five seasons, we get a huge understanding of this. One of these is an excellent show, the other is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Anyway, let's get back on track. After closing down for the night, Jean takes the rubbish out to the bins, but the door slams shut behind him. There is an emergency exit that he can use, but doing so will alert the police, a risk he does not wish to take. So whilst he's sat down waiting, he picks up a screw. When the maintenance guy opens the door, Jean walks straight out, and it's revealed that he carved SG was here into the wall. Despite the radical changes in his life, it would seem that deep down he still sees himself as Saul Goodman. Season 3's opening begins with a sigh from Jean, followed by the song Sugartown by Nancy Sinatra. We see various time lapses before he goes on his lunch break. While sitting down and eating his lunch, a young individual is heading in his direction, and a stolen item falls out of his coat and slides towards Jean. The young man picks it up, and proceeds to hide inside the photo booth. Very shortly after, a policeman asks Jean if he's seen the suspect. He points towards the photo booth, and both the mall security guard and the police officer catch him and place him under arrest. But this does not sit well with Jean. Nice job. Say nothing, you understand? Get a lawyer! Get a lawyer. Jean is unable to leave Saul behind, and when he sees someone that perhaps reminds him of a past client, or at least a past client's actions, he feels the need to stand up and say something. This is what he believed in, and at one point in time, his whole world was surrounded by people like this. Even though he can't directly get involved anymore, he wants to ensure the young man gets himself a lawyer right away, even though said lawyer will never be as good as Saul Goodman. When he gets back to Cinnabon, it is obvious that his outburst has got to him, and he proceeds to faint. Season 4's opening begins with various shots inside the Cinnabon, accompanied with the song We Free, another one by the Ink Spots. Jean is pushed out on the stretcher, spends a bit of time in hospital, and is later discharged. Unfortunately, his national security number isn't showing up on the hospital system. He begins to get very nervous, but it turns out to be a simple mistake on the receptionist part. I typed the letter O instead of a zero. <laughs> Jean feels like there is a big chance that he will get caught out, but thus far it's been a series of perfectly normal situations that can happen to anyone in their everyday life it's too easy to convince yourself of something that isn't really there. But will that be the case in every situation? Jean gets in a taxi outside the hospital, and he notices an Albuquerque Isotopes air freshener in the front, and the driver now giving him some strange looks. Out of all the situations, this is the one that hits closest to home. Could this all be in his head again, or is this individual's connection to Albuquerque concerning news for Jean? The season 5 opening begins with Jean back at the mall to pick up his car and go home. When at home, he takes his diamonds as well as a card to order a new dust filter for a Hoovermax Extract Pressure Pro Model 60. He drives away for a while whilst listening to communications over the police radio. And after spending some time at a diner, he calls the Cinnabon for both work-related reasons and to see if anyone has been around looking for him. Has anybody been asking about me? You know, I mean, like any customers come to the store looking for me, somebody hanging around, or nobody at all.
A few days later, Jean is back at work and we're seeing the usual baking of Cinnabons, accompanied with the song Welcome to My World by Jim Reeves. This scene feels like how all the previous sequences begin, a sad, distant world from Saul Goodman, but a much safer one to be living in. But just as everything feels like business as usual, he goes on his lunch break, and the cab driver approaches. It's you! I just want to say hi, I'm a big fan. You know, back in the day when I lived in Albuquerque with my ex, I used to see you everywhere. You were on the billboards? On the TV? I used to have one of your matchbooks. You got me mixed up with someone. My name is Takovic. Gene Takovic. That is not cool. Don't worry about him, he's cool. <laughs> he just wanted to come along. What do, you, what do you want? I just want you to admit it. I, I don't know what I'm you're- sure you do. Just say it. I really don't know what. Come on. Say it. Better call Saul. Once again, and, and do the point. Better call Saul. There we go. A little rusty, but <laughs> you'll do better next time. You didn't ask, but. Uh, the name's Jeff. Anytime you need me, you just call up Omaha United Cabs. You ask for me, they'll find me no matter where I'm at. Never more than five minutes away. Gene then heads to the phone and calls Best Quality Vacuum. Ed picks up and tells him that he'll be charging double the price for the service this time. Gene spends a moment thinking about it before stating that he's changed his mind and he'll fix it himself. Nippy opens up with an elderly woman on her mobility scooter doing her food shop. On her way back home, her scooter struggles to get over a patch of ice. That's when a gentleman with a very familiar voice offers to give her a hand. Need some help? I'm fine. What happened to poor Nippy? Uh, it was my fault. <sighs> I was driving with the windows open. And I don't know, something got into him. Maybe he saw a cat or something, but he jumped. He was screaming my head off, Nippy! But <laughs> he was gone. Oh, that's terrible. He then gives another offer to push the mobility scooter, and this time she accepts. But as he goes to push it, he cuts the wire without her knowing. And this now means she'll need to be pushed the whole way home. Later on, Jeff is driving his taxi home, and suddenly everything makes sense. So, your mom tells me you're a cab driver? So we never learn how Jean knew Miriam was Jeff's mother, or how he roughly knew her route back from the store. Whenever Saul was after valuable information, Mike was often the one to obtain it for him. It's not a stretch to believe that Jean would be able to independently obtain this information. With that being said, I don't think it would be a problem if the episode incorporated a subtle throwaway line to clear up any confusion or questions that a viewer may have. Let's look at some good examples of throwaway lines from my personal favourite episode, Bagman. Mike saves Saul from the Colombian gang attack, but all the gunfire has caused the vehicles to leak and or have burst tyres. There is no vehicle here that will get them all the way home. So Saul is forced to walk back with $7 million worth of cash in two bags. And it's obviously quite a strain for him. Therefore, an obvious question that a viewer may have is why not dig a hole in the desert and utilize Mike's tracking device to track down these bags of money at a later point? Well, if they were to bury these bags, they would need to have a good idea of the rough whereabouts, as Mike's tracker isn't super advanced and loses signal outside of a certain proximity. But even if that wasn't an issue, they are unable to dig a hole in the first place. So we get two throwaway lines for why this plan simply isn't possible. I had an idea. Let's dig a hole. A hole? Yeah. 
walk out of here, get to civilization, drive back, pick it up, work smarter, not harder. You'll never find it. No, I will, because I'll memorize the landmarks. Like this tree, you can't miss it. That hill, it's distinctive, it's got a hill shape. Yeah, very different from the couple dozen trees that we've seen on hillsides that we've walked past. I will remember, I will find this tree. That's hard pack. If you manage to dig a hole big enough for those two bags, you might as well dig one for yourself. That's not gonna work. You're wasting energy. I'm almost there. And this does follow because the task will only be manageable with the appropriate tool for the job. And as Mike said, you need to take into consideration the type of desert they are in. It's not like digging a hole at the beach. A simple back and forth, followed by an action, has answered valid questions that viewers would otherwise have. These things may not seem like big deals in isolation, but when they're dependent on how the rest of the plot plays out, I believe it's best to acknowledge in the subtlest way possible. Based on the way Jeff behaves in these scenes, it wouldn't be a stretch for him to ask Jean how he managed to get this information and track down his mother. Despite it being something that Jean would likely be able to do, a natural and brief conversation about this could have made the plot of this episode even stronger. But anyway, let's get back on track. The purpose of all of this turns out to be Jean giving Jeff the opportunity as something big. I know it's awkward, right? But you don't have to call me dad. Yet. I don't know what this is about, but all I have to do is pick up the phone and it's bye-bye Saul Goodman. Yeah, but you haven't picked up the phone yet, have you? Or tried to strong arm me for cash. And guess what, I know why. Because reward money, blackmail, that's not gonna tickle your pickle. I know what you really want. Oh yeah, what's that? You want in the game. The game? What, what game? The one you've been watching your entire life. You got your nose pressed up against the glass, peering in while the big boys play. Man, speak English. What the hell are you talking about? The game. It's right there. You can see it, but you can't touch it. Cars, the clothes, the cash, the ladies. It's about knowing all the angles, you know, putting it all on the line and winning big. But here you are, Jeffy, standing outside with the suckers, trying to pay off that cab, sweating the bills, you know, getting older. It's so close, but damn it, you just can't get in until now. So here's the deal. I will show you the game, and then we're done. Gene has had so much experience in this game, and understands how all the moving pieces work. With that being said, after the people he had to deal with towards the end of his career as a criminal lawyer, he feels that he can never be too careful. Dipping his toes back into the game is a huge risk, and him being able to trust Jeff will be extremely important if he's going to proceed with this. So when he gets back home, he turns on the police radio, and just like last time, there is no mention of him. In the next scene, he bakes some Cinnabons, locks up for the night, and goes to the security office. He grabs a cup of coffee, sits down with Frank the security guard, and as Frank tucks into his Cinnabon, Gene starts a timer as the two have a very one-sided conversation about American football. Once Frank has finished his Cinnabon, he turns around and looks at the camera surveillance footage, and Gene stops the timer on his watch. The grand heist ahead is very clear. We then get a montage accompanied with the song Jim on the Move by an artist called Lalo. The montage includes Gene making Cinnabons, doing research on American football, and of course heading back to the security office. And this montage, much like all the others in this show, Breaking Bad and El Camino, is brilliant. What I love about these sequences is how they often contain such mundane situations, like Kim trying to bring a new client to HHM. It's something that in most other shows would be fairly static and dull to watch. But here it's executed with creative camera work, fast paced editing, and a unique upbeat song making it a joy to watch. Most of these montages will include either a time lapse or multiple split screens, all matching the rhythm of the beat and showing similar clips throughout to present the repetition and or progress of events. These sequences tend to have limited dialogue and manage to do a superb job of telling a narrative through visuals alone. The creativity is off the charts. 
and this one showing Gene's current routine is certainly no exception. Once he has established the average time that Frank's eyes are off the cameras, he looks through a bunch of expensive clothes and figures out how big the store is so that he can do a trial run with Jeff. Just this whole thing, it seems crazy. Is this too hot for you? Just say so. You know what, screw it. Crazy. I'll tell you what's crazy. 50 year old high school chemistry teacher comes into my office. The guy is so broke, he can't pay his own mortgage. One year later, he's got a pile of cash as big as a Volkswagen. That's crazy. He is fed up with Jeff already, and you can understand why from his perspective. Walter White couldn't have built his drug empire without Saul. That was a huge operation for him, and this is small potatoes compared to what he's used to, but the plan does go ahead. And in the following scene, Buddy turns up with a delivery for the clothes store, with Jeff hidden inside the box. The manager says it's not for her and therefore can't stay on the loading dock, so she wishes to speak to his supervisor. After some convincing acting from Jean over the phone, she allows the delivery to stay there until morning. So Jean gets on with his usual routine and then sends a message to Jeff. Jeff gets out the box and starts grabbing all the clothes. All is going very well until Jeff slips. You're slipping Jimmy! <coughs> you okay? Frank has now finished his Cinnabon and just as he turns around, Gene pretends to have an emotional breakdown to distract him. <laughs> Look at me! I don't know who I, I don't know who I, Oh God. I have a wife, right Frank? She's waiting for you. I got no one. If I died tonight, my landlord would pack up my stuff. It'd take him three hours. Cinnabon would just hire a new manager. Gene who? Poof! It just been... Nothing. Jeff then puts the clothes in the box and hides in the restroom. It appears to be a successful mission, but not without a lot of panic from both Gene and the audience. The following morning, Jeff gets out the restroom and pretends to look at some clothes in the store before leaving. The box is opened in the next scene and Jeff and Buddy are over the moon. That is until Gene brings down the mood. You guys enjoying yourselves? We'll hold on to that feeling because this is it. Yeah, we know. Uh, well, in case you forget, you transported stolen goods with a value exceeding $5,000, and the truck you used to do it was rented in Council Bluffs across state line. Theft from an interstate shipment, up to 10 years. Transportation of stolen goods, another 10 years. Sale of stolen goods, 10 years. Conspiracy to commit a federal crime. Oh, conspiracy? It was your idea. It's called mutually assured destruction. So, if I go down, you go down. Man, you don't have to threaten us. We're all friends here. I am not your friend. And if you get greedy and you decide to come back for more, don't. Gene Takovic, you never heard of him. The Cottonwood Mall, you don't go there. We're done. Say it. We're done. We're, we're done. This to me feels like Gene has learned a valuable lesson from Walter White and has applied the opposite mentality in this situation. Instead of there being a threat the business is done when Gene says it's done, he instead states that it is done, still inserting the same level of dominance as Walt, but understanding that whilst this one was a successful mission, keeping their heads down is still very important, and pretending they don't know Gene even more so. It's an excellent way of showing how this character has changed. It's very clear that Gene is not happy and optimistic like Saul and presenting it through interactions like these is a great way of showing said change. Ultimately, one success doesn't mean that each one will be, and Gene cutting his losses now is a sensible decision, assuming he's consistent with it. The episode ends with Gene browsing clothes on his lunch break. He looks at a classic Saul Goodman style suit, and much like the pinky ring that he's started wearing again, this represents him returning to his old ways. Amongst a couple of Breaking Bad flashbacks in this episode, 
We also get to see how things are going back in Albuquerque with Saul's old secretary, Francesca. Even though time has clearly passed, it would appear that Francesca still gets followed. She once started working for Jimmy and Kim and brought a lot of positivity into the job. But putting up with Saul Goodman over the years not only made her cynical and jaded, but after all the events that unfolded in Breaking Bad, it has now led to her current day-to-day -day life always being disrupted. But despite that, she is still heading to an old gas station to spend some time speaking with Jean. And where are you going to be November 12th at 3pm? I'll be there, but if it doesn't ring at 3 on the dot, I'm gone. Don't worry, it's going to ring. Yeah. Oh, good. You're there. Great. First things first. No, I, I believe we agreed after. I'm hanging up. Okay, okay then. Jeez. I still get followed. Not as often as when the ship first hit the fan, but I still see them. My mail gets opened. My phone at home clicks whenever I use it. So the maestro buying the farm, it didn't change anything? No, if anything, it made it worse. Skylar White got her deal, so the only ones left to go after are you and Pinkman, and I heard they found his car down by the border, so adios, dopehead. Oh, so they're still into me. Hey, what do you know about the nail salons? Nail salons are gone. What? Gone? All of them? Yep. What about the vending machines? Gone. Jesus! Uh, don't tell me laser tag. Feds found it all, so. But how? It was shells within shells. Damn it. I really love this scene, and I find them having this conversation to be a brilliant excuse to have a natural exposition dump. This information is interesting for the audience to hear, knowing the effects of everything in Breaking Bad and understanding what things look like in the present. But this information is also useful for Gene to hear. The incredibly underappreciated El Camino did a nice job of showing us the effect of everything that went down with two simple establishing shots of what used to be Los Poyos Hermanos and Saul's office. When I saw these for the first time, I felt emptiness. These iconic, well established, and important places from Breaking Bad were now just random buildings in Albuquerque occupied by other businesses. These two shots really say a lot, but what I like about the conversation between Jean and Francesca is that we're seeing the aftermath from a personal character perspective. Breaking Bad certainly functions as its own story, but this information fleshes out the world building even more, whilst providing a different point of view on things. But after all that information is unloaded, they talk about their previous colleagues and move on to talk about a certain someone who was very close to Jimmy. I did get one call. <laughs> After everything went down? Kim. Checking in on me. Your name came up. Asked if you were alive. She asked about me. Later in the episode, Gene is back to Cinnabon making, and we get this slow zoom in on his face, implying that he has an idea of some kind. This simple technique is also used later in the flashback when he thinks about going to visit Walter White. In both cases, he has no one to talk to about his next move. Mike has already given his opinion on Saul approaching Walter, and Gene obviously has no one to talk to, so conveying this message visually is incredibly important. And both these cases are clearly communicating a deep thought, but these deep thoughts are usually what puts him on a bad choice road. This time round, the idea is to bring the boys back together, and Gene will be leading elaborate scams under the name Victor, the same alias he used back in the day. But this goes a little further than a simple bar trick. These scams involve talking to wealthy gentlemen who live alone. Gene will get them very drunk whilst pretending to drink himself. Jeff will then pick them up in his taxi, hand them a bottle of water that's been drugged, and later on, Buddy will enter their property and take pictures of their bank details as well as other sensitive information. This all gets handed over to a third party, and the crew watch the money roll in. Most of these scams are once again presented through a montage, but unlike any other montage in this show, this one feels extremely sad as we watch Gene pour away his life once again. We have got to know this character so well for this show, 
And with the hindsight of Breaking Bad, we know that him getting involved with Walter White was the worst decision he made. Watching the season openings made it appear that even though he wasn't happy, he learned from his mistakes and was trying to move on with his new life. Unfortunately, him getting involved with Jeff and Buddy has put him right back on that path. <sighs> anyway. The scam gets complicated when Gene is speaking to the next target who has cancer. And it turns out that unlike Gene, Buddy is sympathetic towards the man when he finds out about this. And refuses to go ahead with the scam. And the show doesn't hide the fact that Gene's lack of sympathy comes from his bitterness towards Walt. So, a guy with cancer can't be an asshole? Huh, believe me, I speak from experience. I can't rip off a guy with cancer, I'm sorry. Do you know how many of the suckers we've ripped off have sob stories? Every single one of them. We could just let this one go. Not your call. You know, forget it, you're fired, just go. Just give me the camera and go. And with that, Gene decides that he will be the one to break into the man's house. Waterworks presents us with Kim Wexler and her life in Florida with her new boyfriend and friend group. And whilst at her job at Palm Coast Sprinkler, she receives a call from Jean. Kim Wexler. Hey, Kim. You know who this is? Kim, you there? What do you want? You know, I'm just thinking it's been a while, and uh, it might be nice to catch up. It suddenly occurred to me, it's been six years. I mean, Jesus. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought you might want to know I'm still alive. I'm still out here. Still getting away with it. Come on, Kim, say something. <laughs> you can call me an asshole. Yell at me. Just let me know you still got a pulse. You should turn yourself in. Why don't you turn yourself in? Seeing as how you're the one with the guilty conscience, huh? What, what is stopping you? Brings in the ground. Mike's in the ground, Lalo's in the ground, apparently. You don't have to hold back on my account. They can only hang me once, so, so go ahead. Spill your guts, put on your hair shirt, see what it gets you. Kim, why are we even talking about this? We're both too smart to throw our lives away for no reason. Just... Kim. I'm glad you're alive. Despite all the bad things he's done, Gene does raise a fair point here. Is it really fair for Kim to say this when the crusade against Howard was her idea to begin with? The tricks they played on Howard not only led to his life and reputation being ruined, but ultimately led to his death, as him and Lalo never would have crossed paths if the couple simply left him alone. And Kim really takes Jean's comment to heart, and decides to travel back to Albuquerque. This is her attempt to set things right. So she visits Cheryl, Howard Hamlin's wife, and hands her an affidavit, detailing her and Jimmy's schemes against Howard, as well as all the other players involved. Howard was murdered. He was... in the wrong place at the wrong time. It all happened in an instant, and he didn't... he didn't suffer. The lies you two made up, the picture you painted, that's all he is now. That's all anybody remembers. I want to change that. There's a reason why the audience often sympathises with characters like Kim, Jesse, and Nacho. And this is because even though they get involved in so many terrible things, they always try to put things right in the end. Jesse was mortified at the deaths of people who didn't deserve to die, and was extremely shook up when he was the one who had to pull the trigger. Nacho treats regular people with a lot of respect, in ways that his colleagues certainly wouldn't. And with Kim, she is incredibly upset over what happened. She feels talking to Howard's wife and confessing to everything is the least she can do. The spectrum of morality in these shows is thoroughly explored, and makes an effort to say that one can still make a morally good decision, despite all the terrible things they've done in the past. And to show this guilt from Kim even further, whilst on the airport shuttle bus, she has an emotional breakdown, showing tremendous guilt and how everything has caught up with her once again. 
I don't often touch upon acting in my analysis videos, but Ray Seahorn's performance here is a standout. This shot lasts for over a minute and a half, and the emotion she pours into it is simply incredible. But after that heartbreaking scene, we are once again with Jean, picking up from where we left off in the previous episode. The gentleman is in a very deep sleep, and Jean takes full advantage of this by carrying out the usual, but this time he gets greedier, and heads upstairs to help himself to some valuable watches. And if you get greedy, and you decide to come back for more, don't. But shortly after, he looks downstairs and notices the man no longer lying on the floor, and he instead goes and sits down at the bottom of the stairs. Jean is about to go and hit him over the head, but he falls back asleep, so Jean is in the clear. As this is happening though, a police car pulls up behind Jeff whilst parked outside, but these officers are completely unaware of any suspicious activities and are instead eating and talking about food. But Jeff's insane paranoia causes him to drive away at full speed and crash. Now I've spotted a couple of criticisms from people who believe this is a silly and out of character way for Jeff to get caught. Now it's important to understand that Jeff feels like he is in a high tense, stressful situation. And this context is important to understand when analysing any piece of media. Let's look at an example from Mission Impossible Fallout. Why do Ethan and Benji leave the plutonium cores, that can be used to make nuclear weapons, on the side of the road where they're subsequently taken? Well, after the exchange went south, Luther is held at gunpoint. We'll make you a deal, Hunt. Give us the plutonium, and we won't kill your friend. Ethan is then left with a difficult decision of leaving with the plutonium or saving his friend by handing it over. Both result in bad outcomes for different reasons. So he instead starts shooting at them. Luther gets caught in the crossfire, and out of panic for their friend's life, Ethan and Benji run up to him whilst firing at the enemy. Luther is thankfully okay, but their panic for his life means they have left behind the plutonium and therefore it's been taken back. This is a huge consequence that happens because of an emotional response to a highly intense situation. If they had known the outcome, there very well could have been a different and successful plan to both save Luther and keep the plutonium. Whilst it's easy for us, the audience, to point that out, the characters will only know with the benefit of hindsight. Of course, there are plenty of examples where fictional characters make rational decisions in high-pressure situations, but in this specific situation, it is completely in character for both Ethan and Benji to put their friend first, even if it does cost them the mission. This is also a theme heavily echoed throughout the film. And this same idea can be applied to Jeff. He doesn't have the context that the police officers are completely oblivious to what's going on. Jeff has been known to get very nervous before, and that exact paranoia is what led to the crash. The logical thing to do in this situation would be to drive around the area for a little bit, until Jean is ready and can be quickly picked up. But that's only something we the viewers can point out or that Jeff can think about in hindsight. His actions are completely believable within the heat of the moment. But anyway, Jean leaves the scene, and later when he is back at home, he makes himself a drink and is rather relaxed about the whole situation whilst awaiting his phone call. Hey, uh, Dad. It's me. It's, it's Jeff. Jeff, what time is it? Are you okay? Dad, I got arrested. Oh no! What for, Jeffy? It's like this crazy mistake, you know? I mean, I had an accident, okay? A, a little fender bender type deal, no, no big thing. The place where I had the accident, this guy, this drunk guy, he comes wandering out of his house and flags down the cops, the, the police, and says, Hey, you know, I got robbed. And sure enough, the police, they find evidence of like breaking and entering, and, and, and stuff is missing, which I did not do. Uh, when the police took you into custody, did they find any of this so-called stolen merchandise? Was it in your possession? No. Of course it wasn't. Because you didn't steal anything. Therefore, since there's no evidence whatsoever that you committed any crime, I'd say you got nothing to worry about. Breathe deep and sit tight. I'll have you out by lunchtime. You're coming down here yourself? <sighs> no, I think it'll be your mom. You talk to her for me? I sure will. Straighten it all out, no problem. And Jeff, you're gonna get the best legal defense in the whole wide world. Trust your old man on that. Helping people who are being held in police custody is his bread and butter. And he's very much getting a kick out of this when he receives the call from Jeff. 
To some extent, this is one way in which the three are connected. Jimmy was desperate to get clients and was so excited when he actually got them. Saul loved receiving all the new business opportunities. And Jean is just simply happy to be back. I love how this show presents all the ways in which these three connect to each other. Despite the drastically different lifestyles, some things never change. Anyway, Jean phones Miriam about the situation, but makes a few errors. On top of very clearly being up to something in the garage in the previous episode, he told her two episodes ago that he had never been to Albuquerque before. He fell in with a bad crowd back in Albuquerque. Albuquerque, huh? <sighs> never been. But if that were the case, why would he know this piece of information? Right, you just walk into the station, you pay a straight cash bail. It's not like Albuquerque at all. Miriam is also puzzled to why Jeff didn't call her first. Suddenly it's beginning to seem like Jean isn't the man he said he was. And her conclusion for that is not out of left field when you put these several pieces of information together. And therefore, she decides to search for Albuquerque Conman. When Jean arrives at her house, he can hear noise coming from her headphones. What's that? You tell me. Mary, do you think that's me? Because it's not. There never was a nippy, was there? What did Jeff tell you? Oh, he didn't tell me anything. Ask Jeeves told me. I typed in con man in Albuquerque. And up you popped, big as day. What are you doing, Marion? What do you think I'm doing? I'm calling the police. Here, let me help you with that. What'd you get my son into? Nothing that he didn't ask for. I'm still the good friend you thought I was. It's okay, Jeff understands me. Buddy understands me. And you will too. I just have to, uh, you know, keep things on an even keel. What have you got there? Do not do it, Marion. I trusted you. Gene cannot bring himself to cause any harm to her. For all his flaws, he is still human enough to not go to that level. Miriam presses the alarm button and proceeds to speak to someone. Miriam, this is Valerie, the life alert. Are you okay? No, Valerie, I'm not okay. There's a criminal standing in my kitchen threatening me. He's a wanted man, and his name is Saul Goodman. All right, Miriam, I'm calling the police. I'm calling right now. This new life of Jean's has come to an end. Any chance of maintaining this fresh new start and finding true happiness has now slipped away. Jean Takovic is over. Saul Goodman is about to make his final appearance.